Here's a question. I think a good place to start, big picture, and this comes from Josh, so we're going to blame him for this. What is money? And maybe a, a follow-up question, what should money be? George, mm. Lynn? Well, I think the, maybe the best way to approach this, guys, is you guys know so much more about this than I do. I would actually pose the question to you. And George, then, I think you're selling yourself short here, man. You are definitely, you're <laughs> deep in the wheat. You're, you're your own good, great researcher too. I think you're selling yourself short. Well, I, I'll, I'll give my quick answer and then I'll let you guys dive into it. And then I've got some questions that I want to ask both of you. So we'll just turn it into like a, a conversation. I think that's uh, just like we're at dinner, like a real conversation that we would have kind of when the camera wasn't turned on. So if I had to define money, that is very difficult, but I, I think what most people consider money is how many currency units are in the real economy chasing goods and services. So I, 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 would, I would lean toward M2, but and even more so to uh, the checking account balances, more so than, than savings. Um, but I realize that that's a very, very incomplete definition because there's so many things that can be used as money. You know, I've been studying uh, Manmohan Singh quite a bit lately, and I like a word that he uses. He uses the word moneyness. So he says, what is the moneyness of a dollar bill? Or what is the moneyness of a bank reserve? Or what is the moneyness of a treasury? And every one of those things that I just mentioned have components of money in them, for sure. Um, I mean, you could throw gold and Bitcoin in there as well. But is there one true definition? I'm not sure, and I'm not sure that I have it. But I think what most people consider money is just what is a commercial bank deposit liability. I mean, there's obviously two ways to answer the question. One is the more, what is money in the current system, which is how, how George took the question. And then there's what is money in the kind of the philosophical or, or just kind of basic framework. What is money? Like what, that goes back to like Connor gatherer days, for example. Um, I, I would say that the broad idea is that money is that which solves the double coincidence of wants. Um, it's that which makes trade easier. Uh, generally, we perceive it as a unit of account, medium of exchange, ideally a store of value as well to, to varying degrees, uh, at least to a moderate degree, ideally a good degree. Um, it's that which is a fairly universal good, meaning that if you bring it, it's the most saleable good, meaning if you bring it to some sort of marketplace, physical, digital, theoretical, you bring it to this place, you have a, a fairly high assurance that you'll be able to trade that for something else that you specifically want to consume as the end purpose. It's what you um, store value in uh, when you want it to be fairly liquid. Uh, you basically, that again, it's the thing that, you know, at any given moment, you can use that item that to, to get what you want. It's got to be fairly divisible. It's got to be fairly portable all these different characteristics. And, and I agree with George that there's moneyness of different things, that some things are, money is not necessarily an either or, it's not like money or not money, it's, it's there's varying degrees of moneyness, and that's why there's competition between monies. They can be, they can have different properties that, that conflict in various ways. Um, it's often an emergent phenomenon, meaning it comes up to solve a problem. That's why different societies have, have all kind of independently used different types of money. They, they tend to share certain characteristics more often than not. When monies compete with each other, um, there is, you know, it's not a purely subjective phenomenon. Some things make for better money and um, better monies tend to, you know, have a longer lasting time frame than monies that are not good because bad monies get kind of filtered out of the system or uh, at least weak monies get filtered out of the system, or at least they get pushed aside and rendered a smaller part of the economic pie that's happening. Um, in the modern sense, basically, if we say, okay, what is, what is money in the US financial system or the global financial system? Uh, you know, George mentioned um, M2, basically broad money. Um, I think the base money versus broad money comparison is very important because basically if we say, what is a dollar? At the end of the day, a dollar is a direct liability of the Federal Reserve, either in physical form or in bank reserve form. Um, and then there's various IOUs that are built on top of this that we consider our money, right? So when we have a bank account, for example, that is a fraction reserved, um, uh, basically, IOUs for ultimately uh, a, a base layer of the system, a dollar, 
that's a direct liability of the Federal Reserve. Uh, in the modern system, normally when imbalances build up, so a bunch of IOUs per unit of base money, normally the base money is expanded to keep those IOUs money good, at least in the kind of domestic market. Uh, whereas in olden times, um, if the base layer is inflexible or pol policy decisions or otherwise, you could have scenarios where the, the, the IOUs collapse down towards the base money in some sort of credit event. Um, so I'll, I'll roughly stop there other than to say that I then you know, there is, even in the financial system now, there's a degree of moneyness, which is, for example, T-bills are closer to money than long duration bonds which are closer to money than say a house, right? So there's, there's a, as you go something closer to a dollar, you get more moneyness, at least as we, as we you know, currently operate in the, in the financial world we have today. And see, that's where Men Mohan would, would, I think would disagree based on, uh, just to, to a certain extent, because he believes there's more moneyness in T-bills than in bank reserves. But I, I, I want to ask, you know, put Jeff on the spot there as well. But I also want to point out that from a standpoint of functionality, uh, that the, uh, you know, the, the, the broad money uh, functionally is identical uh, to the base money. Right. So anyway, Jeff, do you want to expand on that? Well, I was, you know, I think what Lynn said, one thing that, you, that really caught my attention is how some money usually is an emergent phenomenon. And that's really something that I think is hugely important for the situation that we find ourselves in today, thinking about where things might be going. Um, before we even get into what money is, I mean, an emergent type of money that we nobody even thinks about or even really talks about, one of the biggest monetary systems in the world right now is airline rewards. And you mm -hmm. don't think that's a monetary system, but it is an enormous monetary system, which there is a supply of rewards. It isn't just about flying on a particular airline. They're used for actual real-world purchases all throughout the commercial system. And it is, like I said, enormous. Yeah. And believe it or not, airlines are acting as if they are central banks. They control the supply of rewards. They go beyond central bank functions and actually allocating those supplies to various preferred partners. And we could argue about whether that's a good emergent property or not. I don't think it is, but I mean, in the in the in the limited use case of an uh, airline reward system, it, it seems to work really well. But an emergent phenomenon—that's really—it gets back to to me what money is. To answer that question, it's what's most usable. And I don't disagree with Lynn when she says, you know, there is a degree of objectivity in that regard. The reason why people use gold for so long was because it was objectively better at certain functions that money needs to do uh, accomplish. But in the end, money is not an object unto itself with its own purpose. It is an emergent phenomena who has a specific purpose, which is to be an agent of commerce. And finance comes in afterwards, but it's a, it's a commercial tool first and foremost. And so thinking about it from inside the commercial system, what money should be is the best tool that allows the most efficient exchange of goods across a wide area. Right. And that's where the really gets into... The real interesting discussion, what is the most efficient form of money? What is the best form? I mean, I don't think there is a best form. I think there is temporarily v v uh, different forms that take the best form at that particular time. But that's why you have another form of money emerge, because whatever, whatever system that's being used at a particular time may not be filling all the roles. And human ingenuity will simply come up with something that fills those roles uh, uh, at, at some point. The question is whether or not it does it well enough to replace the, the, the old monetary system and become a new monetary system itself, or whether it's just a temporary niche thing like airline. Uh, I don't think we're going to look at uh, you know United Airlines as the next Federal Reserve. That's not going to happen. But there's a, there is a need and a desire for that to, to take place. And as long as there's a need and a desire, there's a, there's a, there's a hole in the system or there's a, you know, there's, a, there's a desire of commercial agents and participants to undertake something like that then there will always be competing systems. And I think that's something that should be embraced. Mm, um, yeah, competition gonna... is always good. <laughs> so yeah, why shouldn't one... there be competition in money too? Yeah, I was just going to say one thing we definitely all agree on is the free market should be able to choose what it wants to use for money. And that's, that's going to be the best, regardless of what our opinions are. Whatever the free market chooses, that's what's definitely going to be the best, if it's allowed to choose. Yeah, and I don't think there is a best, really. It's... 
And again, that's where you get into the subjectivity. It's what what does what works the best, or what works the what is the most efficient at any one given time. And again, we live in a dynamic world, which means that it's never going to be the same thing all the time. It's remarkable that some systems last as long as they do, which just I think goes to show how usable they can be at, at particular times. Yeah, I remember one time when I was in Ecuador, I I got pulled over by a police officer that just just wanted to be paid off. <laughs> and I, I didn't have any cash on me, but the person that was with me just paid him off in cell phone minutes. Yeah, there you go. There's money right there, <laughs> <True> right? <story. laughs> I'm not sure that would work on a widespread scale, but you know. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let me go ahead and go over some definitions of, uh, because I remember hearing you guys on, I think, Peter's podcast. And I think the first question he asked you is, does the Fed print money? And this is something we hear over and over and over again. And it sounds like you guys uh, disagree on this, but I, I know your positions well. Uh, Jeff, I know your position. Lynn, I know your position. And, and you guys actually don't disagree on this. So I, I think it, it, it's fascinating. So let, let me rephrase the question. Well, does that just yeah. goes to show you how, you know, these are dip difficult and complex topics. And it's, yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah, but but let, but let's let's start this because I think this will be fun. So if I ask Lynn, uh, does the can the Federal Reserve impact M two money supply? What would you say? Yes, they can. Not all of their actions do, but yes, they they have the yeah. capability to do. And, and Jeff, if I ask you that specifically, not does the Fed print money, but can they impact M two money supply? Yeah, indirectly buying, they can. Yes. See. This is see what I'm talking about here, guys. <laughs> we can all hold hands and sing. All right, that's it. Off. Shut it down. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but you know, here's another one. Here's another one. Because if Lynn, if I asked you if the Fed like bailing out a bank, it, that might not be inflationary, but that might be anti-deflationary. What would your view be on that? Well, that's exactly how I would phrase it, and that's the way I phrased it in the past. That basically, when we think of a fractional reserve bank. Whether it's built on gold, whether it's built on dollars, whether it's built on something else, let's call it Bitcoin. You know, if you have a fractional reserve set, and um, you know, there's a couple options a bank can do. If let's say they have 10% of their of their deposits held up in the actual base unit that those deposits are denominated in, if they get 11% of people come back and want their money at once, the bank has a few options. They can, you know, they can, for example, use some of their less liquid collateral and borrow from another bank. To meet that obligation, um, but a problem is if the system is itself so leveraged, or the bank is unable to get other counterparties to work with them, then there's a really real risk that they could, you know, that there's some of their deposits will be defaulted on if some of their collateral is not good or if they're illiquid. And so you can get a case where the M2, the broad money supply, starts collapsing down closer to some number approximating the ba the base layer. That's available, and so one of the things that QE does is, is kind of come in and, and try to stop that from happening, along with other types of, of activities, sometimes fiscal related. Right, and even I think more specifically, not just QE, because that can have an, an impact, or that can be in a time where there isn't a crisis, uh, but more so the Fed bailing out a bank. So if if the Fed comes in with BTFP as an example, they are creating additional bank reserves. That is true in that process. Um, but they're they're literally bailing out banks. So if we can say that broad money is a commercial bank deposit liability, uh, if it's preventing those banks from going bust, then it is definitely propping up M2 money supply because uh, though if the bank goes bust, those commercial bank deposit liabilities are gone. Yes. Yeah, so, and then Jeff, I know we had this conversation just the other day, and if I asked you, you know, did the BTFP save some banks and therefore some M2 money supply, what would you say? I said, yeah, that's that's probably true. Um, yeah. But the issue that I have is whether or not that's meaningful. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, where you want to explain that issue. further? Because I'm in the short term, yes, but you have maybe a different view in the longer term. At the end of the day, what matters is how much, not how much money there is, but how much circulates and for what reason, which is what you were getting into with your question about moneyness. Um, the reason more things, different things are different levels of moneyness is because there are different uses for them. And so there might be, and I don't want to segregate it like this, but just conceptually, there are different forms of money that are more usable and therefore they're more efficient in a commercial situation. So the purpose of 
Federal Reserve's program in bailing out a bank, just specifically in that case, yeah. is to preserve the capacity of the bank to continue to do what banks do. And what do banks do? They don't just issue loans. What is a loan? A loan is the recirculation and redistribution of money through the system in a credit format. But that's all it is. It's about circulation, circulation, circulation. And so if the Fed comes in and bails out a bank that's just going to sit there and do nothing anyway, you might as well let it go out of business. Because you bail out the bank and it doesn't make any more loans, what was the point in bailing out the bank? It doesn't recirculate money through the system. Yeah, it doesn't lose the, the equity that's in the bank. And maybe the depositor's funds, assuming we're talking about a real depository system, they don't get destroyed. But the bank does not do what a bank did beforehand. So what's the point in bailing it out? Um, mm. I think that's ultimately where we get into issues about meaning behind some of these ideas and some of the some of the mechanics of the monetary system is what's the purpose? If bailing out a bank is going to put the bank back in business in the way it was before, then that's a very different proposition than bailing out a bank that doesn't do anything either way. It's just the bank is out of business, so why bother bailing it out? Because in the end, as I said, it's not about the supply of money. It's about the circulation. And whether we like it or not, and I don't particularly like it, but whether we like it or not, banks are the primary agents of circulation through the entire global system. That's the reason why that banks were bailed out in 2008 is because on some level, there was some official understanding of that fact. And again, whether we like it or not, that's the, that's the way it is. And so the idea is to preserve the capacity of the banking system to do its primary intermediation function, which we can argue about whether or not the banks are doing that, have done that well uh, in the recent past and whether they can do it well. But whether whether that's the case or not, that's... This is what we have. We need the banking system to circulate money. And if the banking system isn't going to circulate money, then what's the point behind anything? But doesn't that boil down to risk? You guys know my position on this. And, and for me, it's not really, you know, I think the banks will and can do whatever they want uh, as long as the risk reward makes sense. So, you know, I totally agree with Lynn on this one. It, 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 can we say, Jeff, that if the Fed comes out and bails out XYZ Bank, that that bank might not lend because they're in dire straits, but for the rest of the banks, that sends a signal that, hey, guys, don't worry about it. You can go ahead and take more risk, and therefore but, they will lend more than they otherwise would have. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the idea behind bank reserves from the very beginning. You go back to the 1907 panic, which is where all this framework came from. The idea of using clearinghouse debt certificates as an interbank token to send a message to other dealer banks in the, in the immediate clearinghouse association that, look, we're going to stand behind you. We've examined your books. You're a decent bank. You're in good standing. We're going to give you this quasi-money token so that you can use those on any interbank setting. Therefore, you can leave more cash in your vault. And the purpose behind that was so that the bank would continue to operate in the same fashion as it had beforehand. And the question isn't that. I mean, that's the idea. The question is the execution. Does mm -hmm. it actually work that way? It worked to us an extent in 1907. Uh, but, I mean, how much of that was the clearinghouse debt certificates? How much was it the Treasury depositing funds in New York banks that desperately need it? To Lynn's point, base money. Base money coming into the banking system at the just exactly the right time. And then you fast forward to 1929, 1930, um, and it didn't work all that well. There's... Had even the Federal Reserve introduced a level of bank reserves, would that have made a difference? I mean, Milton Friedman said it would have. I don't think so. I think at that point, banks were already risk averse to the point where the whole system was going to shut down anyway. He, same question in 2008. Had the Federal Reserve introduced even more bank reserves or unsterilized bank reserves from all their TAF auctions and overseas dollar swaps, would that have convinced the banking system we're standing behind you. We've got the primary dealer credit facility. Well, it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't lead the banking system to continue operating the same fashion. And I think the question is, why didn't it work? What was the problem there? Um, that, again, it, it comes down to balance sheet capacity as the agent for redistribution and intermediation, the circulation of funds through the system. Yeah, and in a debt-based monetary system, this is, this is for Lynn, if the Fed is bailing out these banks and maintaining the commercial bank deposit liabilities, I'm just thinking this through. So that is anti-deflationary. But if the banks really stop lending, even though they're still there, could that lead to deflation 
if velocity slows down and we don't have more loans being created than are being paid off. Well, so if you look at official measures of velocity, um, and, and that data is available going back about 150 years or so, uh, the United States has structurally declining velocity uh, for most of that time. There's obviously some points where it declines faster than others. Other, other times it goes up briefly. For example, the 1970s did not have much higher velocity than the 1960s, despite the fact that we had more inflation, because velocity on any given, say, rolling five-year period um, is just not that correlated with measures of inflation or even measures of, of money supply growth uh, for the most part. Yeah, and so I, 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 I generally discount velocity as, as a kind of a key factor. There's other ways to measure how much money's moving around the system. For example, Fedwire processed about one quadrillion in gross settlements last year, right? And that's, that's gross money kind of being sent around between different entities. And that's a, that's a very different measure than velocity as we know it. But if you use that metric, it's a much higher velocity figure when you compare that to the size of the economy or the amount of assets in the system. Um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, it, it's more than just convincing banks what they will or will not do with their lending going forward. It's also about literally whether current customer deposits are there or not, right? So for example, um, if um, a bank has a liquidity crisis and uh, even a solvency crisis and, um, you know, in, in, a, in a system where the base money either can't or won't be increased, then what's going to happen most likely is that some of those deposits are going to be reduced. They're going to have a bank bail-in. They're going to have a, a default on some of those deposits. That destroys broad money. That reduces the capacity of those depositors to purchase things in the economy. Uh, and therefore, that, that would have a generally, all, all else being equal, a disinflationary or outright deflationary effect on the economy. And so in, in kind of a, a situation where banks can create deposits by lending, they can, they can grow broad money on top of a base money, um, that's generally punctuated by periods of contraction of the broad money supply. But in the current system, instead, whenever there would be a contraction, uh, any sort of meaningful contraction of the broad money supply, instead, various centralized entities, whether it's the Fed unilaterally or sometimes the Fed in cooperation with, with some fiscal support as well, increases the base money and prevents that broad money from going down. And so the counterfactual is not zero inflation or not zero money supply growth. The counterfactual is contraction in broad money supply. And so the, the mere fact that it stays where it is or continues growing up slowly is an impact from the Federal Reserve and, and related entities. But do you think that would lead, do you think the end game there, let's just assume M2 stays flat and we've got declining velocity. Do you, uh, all else being equal, you think that end game is deflation? If you had flat money supply and sharply declining velocity, that's generally indicative of a, a like a liquidity shock. Yeah. Like you would see, for example, during early 2020, that, that period would probably be characterized by disinflation or very brief yeah. deflation. But in any given kind of more like longer rolling period, there's not a lot of correlation between velocity and, and right. either CPI inflation or, or money supply growth. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the calculations of velocity have been unusable for decades, I mean, half a century, because they don't apply to anything that's real. Um, problem with the calculations of velocity is they rely on bad money supply numbers. M2 is not an exhaustive, not exhaustive and comprehensive of the entire monetary system because you have to think globally, first of all. So if you're doing a velocity calculation of a bad supply number, velocity is just a plug line er error term. Um, so you can't, I mean, even the Federal Reserve realized in the early 1990s, they couldn't rely on the velocity statistics. So as Lynn said, you, they don't tell you anything. Velocity, the numbers that you see people talk about velocity are not realistic numbers of actual velocity. And I agree, Lynn, you're, the idea of using something like Fedwire, I look at chips volumes, uh, which is the amount of process transactions through chips. Those are better ideas of velocity. But even then, it's a very, very rough proxy. It's not actually a, hey, velocity is actually this, and we know it to the third decimal point. We really don't. We have, a, we have, to, we have to scour all of these different data points to get a very a rough approximation of what circulation might be, which leads us to, I think, what is one of the bigger problems that we all have is, again, you're talking about defining terms. What is the actual money supply that we're, we're, we're using here? 
And there's very different forms of money supply. There's very different places where different forms are. And so it makes it incredibly difficult for having this discussion that we're even having right now. We talk about a you know, liquidity shock and um, you know, a velocity and circulation breakdown, base money, broad money. We don't have any statistics that would actually define those for us. We have some, some rough idea of what's happening, but that's why I look at what markets are telling us because regardless of whether we can define what money is, the actual usable monetary system or the actual usable money in the monetary system is being used by these participants and they're giving us a sense of what it is. Even if we can't quantify it in a specific term or calculate a velocity number, we do have an idea of what money might be doing in the shadow that we can't see because the system itself gives us that information. Yeah, I think that velocity really matters, but it's, it's almost impossible to measure. We have no idea. We have no yeah. idea what velocity actually is. But I do think that it, I think it matters it uh, does. quite a bit at the end of the day. Um, you know, one thing I was... Uh, well, that's, I mean, George, well, think about this. Look, the 1930s, the worst depression in maybe human history, probably was, there was plenty of money. There was more than enough money in the world. There was more than enough gold in the world to pay off all those liabilities. What happened was it stopped moving. France hoarded all of its gold, took a bunch of gold home, put it in Paris, and didn't allow anybody to access it. The well, United States had money. Banks had money. There was base money available, but it stopped circulating. So it wasn't a supply issue. It was a circulation issue. And when circulation stops, it interrupts the operations of the banking system and intermediation, which then leads to all of these other problems that Lynn was talking about. Banks right. become less confident and sold shit. They're like, okay. I can't expand my balance sheet or broad money. Maybe I actually have to start calling in loans just as a defensive mechanism because I'm not really sure I can get money. If I get a depositor run, I can't go into a wholesale marketplace or go to my correspondent bank and say I need some funds. They're not there to provide it. So the breakdown in circulation is the far more important variable. So velocity is the thing, and that's the thing that we know least about. That's the real, yeah. that's the real and, problem here. And yeah. I, I would say implicit in that is is the the importance of fractional reserve banking in our system yes. because that that's what affects all of, of what you just said. And so, for example, during the Great Depression, in the years prior to that, you had a buildup of of tons of debt, tons of credit, tons of deposits. Deposits, relative, yes, huge, yeah. skyrocketing deposits. Yeah. Relative to a fairly fixed money uh, money supply base, I mean a slowly growing base of of mine gold and and kind of you know central bank uh, layers built on gold and things like that. And so, I, I often like to use the description of musical chairs, right? So if you have a, a bunch of kids playing musical chairs, so for the few people in the audience that might not know the game, you, you put a bunch of chairs. Let's, let's call it you know ten chairs and eleven kids. And they go around the chairs and the music's playing. When the music stops, they all have to sit down on one of the chairs and one unlucky kid is not going to get a seat. And then you take away – and that, that kid's out of the game. You take a chair out and yet, then you have you know 10 kids and nine chairs and you keep repeating until one lucky or one fast kid wins at the end. Um, now, if you ask the question, let's say you have a, a big game of musical chairs. There's, there's 20 kids going around chairs. How many chairs do you need for that number of kids? Well, if the music's playing, zero. Or one, you don't need any chairs, right? The the number of chairs relative to kids matters when the music stops, because that's that's basically when you find out that you know people have been swimming swimming naked. That there's basically there's not as many chairs relative to people that need to sit in them. Using using the banking analogy, right? So we fractures or banking is inherently based on a kind of a mismatch of promises. They're saying to the depositors, you can get your money at any time, uh, at least within banking hours. And yet they know that a majority of those are in illiquid assets and that at any given time there's way more claims for money than there are uh, actual monetary units. And so they need that circulation to keep going. They need that music to keep playing. And one of my favorite references that I, that I referenced actually in my book was um, in 1875, William Stanley Jevons um, uh, wrote a book called Money and the Mechanism of Exchange. And he's kind of just analyzing the monetary system as it existed at the time primarily centered you know, more around London than, than anywhere else. And he's pointing out that their systems become so efficient for moving things around, right? So with the, with the invention of the telegraph and the kind of the, the, the undersea cable and like, you know, transcontinental cables um, as, as, uh, combined with all their various paper instruments, 
he's pointing out that we can move all these claims for gold around so effortlessly that we that we barely ever have to move actual gold. Only in occasional imbalances do we ever actually have to move physical gold, and it's hyper efficient, and that's a good thing. But on the other hand, he's like, this has become so efficient that we've become so far removed from what actually these claims represent. And he's like, this this system's now levered twenty to one. If five percent of people show up and want actual gold, the system doesn't have it. And of course, what we know from history is that once World War One happened, that's basically what happened. The music stopped. There weren't enough chairs. Um, all the efficiency of the system kind of ground to a halt. And you know, at the end of the day, it's just that that's that's the nature of a fractional reserve system that that it needs that constant dance to keep happening. Otherwise, it just it it falls apart of a fractional reserve system that that it needs that constant dance to keep happening otherwise it just it it falls apart yeah you know it reminds me of it reminds me of even today just in time inventories because that's what it is it's expensive it's cumbersome it's inefficient to have to hold reserves it's so much better if i can just if i need to if a customer i didn't expect comes in today and takes a little bit more out of my vault I can order funds from somebody else in the wholesale marketplace. I don't need to have idle funds sitting in my vault. I have this entire correspondent interbank system built up that can circulate funds on a moment's notice that allows me to be more efficient in what I do. And I think the important part of that discussion is whether that whether or not that's a good thing. And then I think before we get to that, though, does the amount of chairs um, – because the idea is, how do we get banks to do what, what they're doing? How do we In a fraction reserve system, we need them to constantly do their intermediation functions. What are the factors that determine their willingness to be able to, to, to play in that system? Is it, is it the music that's playing? Is it the number of chairs that they, that they see uh, in, the, in the game? What is it that keeps banks engaged? Where, where are their... Where are their incentives, and is it just is it just psychology that creates the uh, the willingness to circulate money and expand balance sheets and activities? I think that's one thing that I struggle with. Is you know most economists believe that this monetary business really does come down to psychology, and a lot of it is psychology. It's not just the amount of money that's available or there's some statistic about circulation of funds through Fedwire. There is a whole lot of psychology involved with it, and you have to wonder what are the specific dimensions that go into velocity for whatever concept that is. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, Lynn just hits the nail on the head there with that analogy. But one thing that I try to point out, because I think it matters, is that uh, the, 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 there's a lot of entities that can create chairs. It, it's not just the Federal Reserve. Like JP Morgan could create more chairs. Now, to Lynn's point, if the music stops, then what that implies is that J.P. Morgan isn't going to create those chairs or the federal government isn't going to create those chairs. But I do think it's important to understand well, no, the I mean, multiple the, entities the, that can do that. And then one George, more thing. The, the yeah. purpose of the Fed, though, was to be the one entity that would create the chairs in times right. when J.P. Morgan won't. Right, right. Yeah, so I the understand. question is whether or not the, J, the Fed's chairs are actual usable chairs in the game that's playing. Yeah. I would actually change the analogy slightly there okay. to say that only the Federal Reserve can create chairs. Entities like J.P. Morgan have the ability to keep the music playing uh, when other entities can't. Because at the end of the day, uh, in the current system, a, a dollar is a, a you know a liability of the Federal Reserve, uh, and so even J.P. Morgan can call it be caught out without chairs. Yeah. But because they're so big and and you know fairly conservative managed. Um, they generally have the capacity to provide. They, you know, if the music stops, they can actually go back over and turn it on a little bit more. Yeah, um, but point. they can choose not to. Um, so that's, so the, yeah. that's, sorry, George. I think that's one place, one area where I disagree with you. I think that J.P. Morgan actually creates the chairs, and the Fed doesn't. Um, J.P. Morgan and the, ba- and the banking system are the ones who are actually creating the chairs, uh, because we don't need physical dollars or Federal Reserve reserves in order for them to create dollars on their balance sheet. So J.P. Morgan is out there creating chairs. And what happened in 2008 was they decided they didn't want to because of all the risks that had built up in the system and that there was no convertibility crisis. It wasn't like everybody was trying to get physical dollars as payment and settlement mechanisms. It was just that J.P. Morgan said, I'm done. I'm out. And without J.P. Morgan and without Bank of New York Mellon and all of the, uh, the foreign reserve banks, the English banks and the Swiss banks, UBS was a huge part of it. Without the, these banking uh, banking entities to create more chairs, that's when the music stopped playing. Yeah, I think 
what I'd add to this, a couple things. Uh, first and foremost, it, it begs the question, do the chairs matter if the music is still playing? Uh, yeah, it's playing, not, <laughs> not particularly. That, that, that's one. And, and number two would be... Who plays the music? Who controls the music? <laughs> yeah. but, but number two would be, I think that the, the listener needs to differentiate between uh, different types of bank runs, like a modern day bank run compared to uh, the, the bank run of the, what was the movies in the, the movie in the 1930s? It's a Wonderful Life. Wonderful Life there, thank you. And that a lot of people think that uh, Silicon Valley Bank went bust because everyone went down there and demanded green pieces of paper. And that's, that's a lot different than a bank run being, hey, I don't want my you know, $100,000 of green pieces of paper uh, that only you, the Federal Reserve, can print but I want you to transfer my $100,000 deposit liability to another bank, uh, in which case you can do that using bank reserves or you can do that using, uh, let's just say, J.P. Morgan money, uh, as long as, to Lynn's point, J.P. Morgan is willing to go back and hit the rewind button and the play button again. Yeah, I agree. I think there's, there's a very big distinction here between the traditional fractional reserve system and what I call the euro dollar era, which went beyond it, which in many senses eliminated the reserve to begin with. So it's no longer fractioning a reserve. It's just creating claims. It's basically a ledger money system, pure ledger money system, which means there's a big difference. That's why you didn't have long queues in 2008 of depositors lined up to empty ATMs. And to your point, George, we didn't have that in last year either. It's all electronic on the ledger. And so the ledger expands and contracts based on the willingness and ability of banks operating the ledger to expand and contract their balance sheet. And so what we're left with is what is it that makes bank banks want to expand and contract their balance sheet, thereby expanding and contracting the, the, the monetary ledger that we all use? Is it, uh, is it just... Um, you know, does the Federal Reserve has a, have a pathway to influence bank behavior? They certainly think that they do. I think the, the results are relatively dubious in that regard. Um, but that's really the issue here. When we talk about it's not, again, it's not about supply. It's about circulation in this ledger money system. And so to me, there's not really a distinction between broad money and base money. There is simply just bank money. And if there's just bank money, the central point is all about the willingness of banks to circulate, to create, and do all of the functions, the monetary functions, that are necessary to keep the system going. And again, we don't have to like it. I certainly don't like it. I don't like having you know, these big banks, the enormous political power and economic influence, but that's, we have to realize that's the way it is. And this, I think, segues into the next discussion, which is, what should we do about it? <laughs> Thinking ahead, as the system continues to re move more and more toward the end of its shelf life, what comes after it? If we have the ability to create another system, what would that look like? Huge, huge thank you to Lynn Alden and George Gammon for taking so much time out of their busy schedules to stop by with Eurodollar University and dive deep into these big, incredibly important monetary issues. And they did take an enormous amount of time out of the schedule because what you've just seen is only half of it. Actually, not even half of it. The rest of the conversation, the majority of it, we got into topics like what comes next after the euro dollar era and how do we get between where we are today and where we want to go tomorrow? And what does that look like? What is it that we really want out of a monetary system? That's what's in the rest of the conversation between the three of us. And it is available only for Eurodollar University members and DDA subscribers. If you are one of those, just head on over to the Eurodollar University members section, the video, the interview, the full conversation actually has been available for a couple days now. And if you want to become a Eurodollar University member subscriber, simply follow the link in the description. And there's a whole lot more there as a member or subscriber than just these conversations, though maybe those are worth the price of subscription anyway. We just got done with Kenny McElroy, Jim Rickards has stopped by, Macro, Alf, and a whole bunch of others, and there are many more to follow. But also, the Eurodollar University memberships include detailed background history and diagrams of what the Eurodollar system actually is so that we can understand what it is we're actually trying to talk about in analyzing the current circumstances and what it means for not just today, but hopefully tomorrow too. So DDA subscriptions, there's a daily briefing subscription, membership subscriptions, all available at our website, eurodollar.com. 
dddafs.university. Again, if you're interested in becoming a member or a DDA subscriber, there will be a link in the description of this video. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Again, huge thank you. Lynn Alden, George Gammon, cannot thank them enough for taking so much time. And until next time, take care.